This is a short video about Carthiodorus theorem and the chain rule. So we'll use Carthiodorus theorem to prove the chain rule from, you know, Calc 1. So without further ado, what is Carthiodorus theorem? So let f be a function that's defined on some interval i that contains some point c. Carthiodorus theorem is a characterization of what it means to be f to be differentiable at that point c. So f's differentiable at c if and only if the following. There is this a function phi. If you're a LaTeX user, that's verify. If you want to say phi, that's fine. Just try not to get annoyed with me when I keep saying phi. Um, so there exists this function phi on i that's continuous at our point c, and it satisfies the following equation. And the equation is f of x minus f of c is equal to phi of x times x minus c. And so it should satisfy that equation. In other words, this function should satisfy that for every x in the domain of my function i. And in this case as well, what happens when you plug c into phi, then it should just be the value f prime of c. So maybe in a picture, let's wrap our heads around like, what's Carl Theodore's idea with this function phi? And so what I've got is maybe a graph of f. And so what we're trying to say that this phi is doing here, this phi should be a continuous function. And if I think about this equation that phi has to satisfy, remember that is the slope of the line. If you solve that for phi of x, that's the slope of the line between the two points on the graph of f when the input's x and the input's c. In other words, this function phi from Carthiodorus theorem, it's tracking the slope of these secant lines. And what the idea is, is that, well, as I take this point x and I move it closer and closer to c, so in my picture as I go to the left, I know that that secant line should actually become, like legitimately, the tangent line where the slope of the tangent line is the derivative. And that's what this last part's trying to say, is that the value of that function should be the value of the derivative at that point. So that's, again, another way to think about what the derivative should be. All right, so how do we prove this, actually? So we've got an if and only if here. So what do we got to do? If we assume, so there's a weird then there, assume f's differentiable at c, we want to show that there exists this function phi. Well, if we assume f's differentiable at c, why don't we just do the following? I'll just define that phi to be, again, the slope of the line that connects those two points. So like in my picture there, if x is not equal to c, and in the case that x equals c, I'll just say, well, it's going to be the derivative there. So again, that'll just be the slope of the tangent line at that particular point is what this part is. So I have the freedom to just define what phi ought to be. And so what do we want to do? We want to make sure that, sorry, I'm scrolling around a little bit. We want to make sure that phi is continuous at our point C. And uh, finally, after that, we'll make sure that it satisfies this, this equation here. But so far, for sure, phi of C is f prime of C, right? We've got that for sure. All right, so why do I, how can I justify that it's continuous? Well, remember to be continuous, that means that the limit as x approaches C of my function ought to just be phi of C. That's what I need to justify. So let's think about this limit, right? So as x approaches c, well, that means x probably isn't equal to c. So the expression I'd use for phi is this one, right? That's what phi is when x is not equal to c. So I'll take the limit of that. But what do I know the limit of that is? I know that uh, f prime of c exists. Therefore, well, hey, that's what this limit is, right? That's the definition of the derivative of f at c. And what do I know f prime of c is one more time? Oh, here's f prime of c. That happens when x is c, so that's phi of c. So we just justified that phi is continuous because the limit as x approaches c of phi of x just turns out to be phi of c is what we're saying here. So definitely continuous at c. And uh, last but not least, again, if x is not equal to c, well, then here's my expression for phi. Um, what I'm going to do is phi of x equals this, I'm going to multiply both sides by x minus c. So here's me multiplying the left side of that piecewise function by x minus c, and here's me multiplying the right side of that piecewise function by x minus c. And uh, what do I get? Well, I see on the right side, those x minus c's cancel, so boom, they're gone now, and you get phi of x times x minus c is f of x minus f of c, which is that sort of a functional equation that phi was supposed to satisfy. So that works if x is not equal to c. Now what happens when x is equal to c, right? That's all I've got to have left in order to say that this holds for all x in my interval. So c is the only point remaining. But if x is equal to c, well then what happens when you plug c in for all these here? Well, this would be f of c minus f of c, so that's a big fat zero. And this would be a zero also. 
And so I just wrote that down here. You get zero on the left, time, and on the right you get 5c times zero. I don't care what 5c is, it's just zero equals zero, which is certainly true. Therefore, uh, phi of x satisfies that functional equation here for every x in my interval i. So that's one direction of Carthiodori's theorem. Let's go the other way. So the other way is we're gonna assume that we have this magical function phi that's continuous at c, and that phi satisfies this functional equation for all points x in my interval i. What I need to show is that f prime of c exists. So what do we know? If x is not equal to c, then what we're able to do is we're able to divide this whole thing by this x minus c here, right? If it's non-zero. So remember, x not equal to c is equivalent to saying x minus c is non-zero. So then if I rearrange that, that, does, that says phi is this, and it looks familiar, right? The whole idea of this phi was it's supposed to be, again, the slope of the secant line for those two points uh, when my input's x and my input's c. And uh, what else do I know? I get to assume that phi is continuous, so I know what the limit should be. It needs to be phi of c. I know what that has to be. So that means that when I take the limit of both sides of this, the left side has to be phi of c, and that's a number, right? So that means the limit of this side as x approaches c also exists, and that makes me happy because that's the definition of f prime of c. So that's what we're about to write down. So phi of c should be equal to, that's the limit of this side. It's gotta be the limit of this side as well, which is right here. And what I'm saying to you is, this is a real number, which says, uh, sorry, this should be not phi, but f is differentiable at c because it exists, and of course phi of c should just be whatever f prime of c is, right? That's what the limit of this is defined to be, phi of c, which has to be f prime of c, right? There's only one derivative. Okay, so that's the proof of Carthiodori's theorem. So now what are we gonna do? Carthiodori's theorem is really useful for us to give a really clean proof of the chain rule. What is the chain rule, by the way? So the chain rule, if you remember, is about how to differentiate the composition of functions. So how we're gonna do this, let i and j be two intervals. Let's say g is a function whose domain is i. Let's say f is a function whose domain is j. And uh, let's say that f of j is contained in i. So uh, in other words, um, the range of f is contained in the domain of g. That's what that's trying to say. And finally, let's let c be an i. So maybe we need a picture to kind of help us out here. So I'm starting over here in J, and that's where C lives. We're gonna plug all that stuff in orange. We're gonna plug that into this function F, which spits out numbers. And I'm saying that everything in the orange, when you run it through F, it needs to land in the purple interval I. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug those into G. And what we wanna look at is the function G composed with F, which should just start here from J and make us land over here and you know whatever that interval is. Now, here are the assumptions. What if I knew that each piece, f and g, were differentiable? What can you say about the composition? Well, it's differentiable too, of course. That's the uh, content of the chain rule. And what is the actual formula for the derivative of the composition? Remember, it is g prime times f of c times f prime of c. So in other words, the derivative of the outside times what you get when you plug uh, the inside function in times the derivative of the outside. I don't remember if there's a slicker way to say that my poor calculus one students. Anyway, how do you prove this thing? So what do we get to assume? Well, if f's differentiable at c, okay. So I know f prime exists. And uh, what did we just get done doing? Oh yeah, that Carthiodori's theorem. f prime exists at c, if and only if, I get this cool function phi that's continuous at c, and I get this cool equation to play with. Okay, let's go use that. So sorry, I'm scrolling a lot. I'll try to not do that as much. So Carthiodori's theorem applies. There exists some cool function phi whose domain is the same as the domain of f, uh, but in particular it's continuous at c, such that though, again, f of x minus f of c is equal to phi of x times x minus c for every x in the domain of f, which is j. And moreover, the value of phi when uh, x is c is the derivative. And uh, how come that happened again? Because f prime exists. Similarly, I know g is differentiable, right? g is also differentiable at the point f of c, right? And in my picture, right, I plug f of c into g and it spits something else out. So f of c is in the domain of g. I'm assuming that g is differentiable there. I could do a similar statement about Carthiodori's theorem. So Carthiodori's theorem applied to g tells me there exists some other cool function who, uh, whose name is psi here that's continuous at the point f of c. And again, it satisfies this functional equation here. Same exact form. Uh, for every single y that's in the domain of g, and moreover, the 
value of psi when you plug in our special point f of c ought to just be the derivative of g at our special point f of c. Now, if this should happen, if this equation should hold for every single point y that's in the domain of g, well, if, uh, what else did I assume up here? I assume that any x that's uh, in j, f sends it to i, right? That's what this says here. So in other words, this is trying to say that uh, f of x should be in here as well. f of x should be in i. So if it holds for all, all points in i, it should hold for all points that were in the range of f. That's what I'm trying to say. So in particular, right, for y that's equal to f of x, we see, let's just change these y's to f of x's. So that's all I'm doing here, here, and here. Now we're going to rewrite this a little bit. On the right side, I think, this is the composition of psi with f. And uh, what else do I know? Remember, Carthiodorus theorem applied to f told me that f of x minus f of c is phi of x times x minus c. Why don't we wrote that down right up here? So I'm just making that substitution in. And that holds for every single x that's in the domain of f, right, which is j, so long as the output is in the domain of g. OK, where are we at so far? I want to play around with this side a little bit more. So what do I know? I knew that f's differentiable, so it's continuous. Um, and uh, let's see, psi is continuous by hypothesis from Carthiodorus theorem. And I know that the product, or sorry, so so far, the composition of two continuous functions is also continuous. That's pretty cool. I know phi is continuous from Carthiodorus theorem. And what else do I know about continuous function? I know the product of two continuous functions is continuous. Goodness, that was a lot to say. So that is like multiplication right there between them. Saying function number one here times function number two here times it. So anyway, product of continuous functions is continuous. So this whole thing is continuous at C. All right, why is that good? What I'm going to do is I'm going to think about what's the value of this function at C. All right, so if I think about that again, uh, how do you take you know, how do you define the product of two functions? I just should plug C into each one of these two individually. And that's what I'm saying to you here. And what do you get when you do that? Well, how do you do the composition? I know the composition. You plug C into F first. That's like the inside function. So that's what I'm saying to you here. Now I'm going to think about what these things are. I know that phi of C is the same as F prime of C. And what else do I know? I know that psi of f of c is the same thing as g prime of f of c, right? If you remember up here, that was part of the hypothesis that we had, or maybe not hypothesis, that was part of the conclusion from Carthiodorus theorem when we applied it to g. Okay, so by Carthiodorus theorem, what have we got? We have got that g composed with f ought to be differentiable at c because we just found a function who plays that role from Carthiodorus theorem. This function here, it's continuous at C, and I see that the value of that function up there at C is equal to the derivative that I wanted, right? That should be the derivative of the composition. So therefore, again, by Carthiodorus theorem, it's, since I've got that function, equivalently, G composed with F's differentiable at C, and the formula for the derivative is exactly the formula that we just found. So in other words, the formula for the derivative is exactly this right here. And that's the end of the proof of the chain rule.